Welcome to the Cash Car Convert Podcast, episode number 33. You're listening to the Cash Car Convert Podcast with James Kinson. Hello and welcome to the Cash Car Convert Podcast. My name is James Kinson and I am the Cash Car Convert. And this is the podcast where cash cars are cool and auto debt is dangerous to your financial future. For today's guest, between engagement and I do, they had all the tough conversations about money that most couples avoid for decades, if they ever have them. The first year of marriage, financially speaking, was rough. They planned a wedding honeymoon, and a short sale of their house, all at the same time. They had to hold on for dear life just to make it through the first few years. They came through together and created a plan for their marriage and their money. Not so much because they wanted to, but because they had to. They grew and they learned, and they learned so much in the process as a result. This allows them to grow from insecurity and discomfort to an awesome, healthy place in their relationship and their finances. And best of all, Now they help others have better conversations and let you in on theirs as well. They believe you too can get on the same page with your money, marriage, and life. And with all the witty repartee they have on their podcast, I know I'm going to have my work cut out for me. (laughs) Please with that, welcome Derek and Carrie Olson from the Better Conversations on Marriage and Money podcast. Welcome to the show, guys. Thanks for having us. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for, uh, for being on. I I love your show. Uh, I really, I really do enjoy the the repartee between the two of you. Um, It just, it's so enjoyable and you guys just, you know, it's so genuine. And I think I really appreciate that a lot. Thank you. We're so glad to be here. I always start my show by asking people what their first car was, how they got it and how it worked out for them. And I'm going to say, Carrie, ladies first. All right. My very first car, I believe, was a hand-me-down from my older brother, so this was a 1991 Mercury Sable. I don't even know if those exist anymore. Um, I think that I only had it for maybe a month because it died. And then I bought a 1985 Pontiac Grand Am for $800 cash. and drove that for, <laughs> for a while. Cash car from early on. I like it. <laughs> All right, Derek, how about you? My first car was a 1983 Honda Accord. And it was also a hand-me-down. Um, it, I think we bought it. I don't think my family bought it new. I think my family bought it used. And then it was it was my mom's at first. And it literally got handed down from my mom to my older brother. And then it got handed down to my older sister. And then it got handed down to me. And then it even got handed down from me to my younger brother. So... Five of us drove that car. We drove that car into the ground. It was a good car. Wow. You know, the thing I really like about that story, uh, Derek, is that, you know, your family obviously was being very smart with their finances around cars. I mean, they didn't go out and buy each kid a new car or even a, you know, an expensive used car. Um, I think that's really smart uh, and uh, and, and really, uh, you know, I I suspect that had an impact on you in terms of how you view vehicles. Is that fair? Yeah. And, you know, that wasn't the only car that got handed down. So if you were doing the math there, there's four kids in my family. And so every time one of the kids turned 16, my mom would get a new car and all the cars would just shift down a kid. So (laughs) we had several cars that got that got, um, you know, passed on down the line, so to speak. So that was one thing that I remember early on was nothing but used cars in our family. We had a bunch of them. In in fact, I mean, I remember one time at one point in time, all, so there's four kids and plus two parents. So that's six cars right there. Wow. And then my dad had an extra work or it was just like a truck for, you know, hauling stuff here and there. And then, so that's seven cars. And then at one time, my dad also had like a hot rod car. And so we've got a picture with all eight of those cars out in our driveway and all and all six of us standing there. It's a great picture. Wow. I want to be your auto insurance agent. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, definitely. Wow. Well, that's cool. Now, despite all the cars you had in your family, as I understand it, when you guys got married, neither of you had a car. So how did you find yourself carless? And and what did you do to get around and what was that experience like? 
It was so much fun. So what happened right when we got married, Derek had a company car for work. And right after we got married, he actually uh, quit that job. So we didn't got rid of that car. And then he was driving around a 1977 V-Dub pop top bus. And that's what he drove when we were dating and engaged. He actually sold it to buy my engagement ring. Oh, wow. So, so he was carless there. And then I had gotten rid of my SUV when I moved to Midtown. I lived literally three blocks from where I worked. So I could walk to work and I bought a moped instead. So I spent, I think, $425 on this little used moped. And that's how I got around. And how did you get around, Derek? Well, <laughs> at, at that point in time, we were carless and I, I had quit my job and I started working from home. So that's how I got around was just on my feet. And eventually I actually bought a moped too. Then I bought a 1980 Honda, pa I think it's called a Passport. It's a little um, 70cc three-speed uh, bike and it was so much fun. And I would get around town on that thing. So we were either on mopeds or on foot. And we even took the bus a little bit. So for a year at the beginning of our marriage, we were carless. And it, and, it, and like Carrie said, it was actually fun. It was an interesting shift in the way that you have to live your life when you're carless. You have to think about things differently. And guess what? It's totally doable. Of course, depending on what part of town you live in, we live in a part of town where we can walk almost everywhere. We're in the inner city of Kansas City, Missouri. And there's also a bus line, a pretty decent bus line here. And so during that period of time, just, again, thinking about transportation differently and being out of the frame of mind of just jump in the car for an entire year, we really learned a lot from from that experience. Wow, I bet you did. And, and you know, I'm down here in Texas and and I'm out in the suburbs, so things are spread out. I can't fathom. Uh, not having a vehicle, especially not for an entire year. So that's, that's pretty mind blowing. Uh, but you guys came through it. Okay. So, uh, and, and it sounds like even, you know, you learned some lessons there that maybe have been valuable, valuable to you going forward. Right. Yeah. Um, really one of the interesting things, I'm not so sure if this is a lesson, but it's a really interesting thing that I wasn't expecting. Uh, there's, there was a certain amount of freedom associated with not having a car. It was really interesting. I wasn't expecting that going in. Um, you, you would think that having a car is synony synonymous with, with more freedom, right? That you can go anywhere, anytime. But there is a certain amount of freedom in not having a car, freedom from auto repairs, freedom from gasoline, freedom from uh, insurance, and even just the freedom. I know this sounds really small, but it was interesting just the freedom of not having to keep track of your car. Where, where did I park my car? Where <laughs> is my car? Let's go get the car. All of that kind of stuff for an entire year. That's out the window. So I never once thought, you know, where's the car? Let's go get the car. Even though it sounds really simple, it was unexpectedly, um, a, a certain amount of freedom associated with it. So that was one interesting thing during that, during that time, time frame. Wow. That's really good. I think for us, too, it was kind of a novelty because both Derek and I grew up in the suburbs. So there was no way that we could have survived without cars or could have walked everywhere. And then, you know, we get married, we moved to the inner city and we just wanted to enjoy it. And we did. We loved just walking around and enjoying our city. Yeah, I know I travel um, a lot to the D.C. area and, and stay in downtown D.C. And it's it's much more of a walker friendly kind of lifestyle. And there's there's lots of modes of transportation there. There their subway and so forth. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's really interesting, but uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't have expected it to be freeing. So that's a really interesting, uh, uh point of view there. It's, uh, so glad, glad to hear that. Now, one other thing before we jump into more of your story, um, I know enough about you guys to know that you name all your vehicles and I would just <laughs> love to hear the history behind that. Okay. I can name them off really quick. Um, well, well, let's start with my uh, V-Dub. Uh, uh, Carrie mentioned I had a 1977 V-Dub camper bus. And that that car's name was Colonel Mustard because it was yellow. So that was Colonel Mustard. Carrie's moped was Hubert, right? Yeah. Hubert. Hubert Alexander. Oh, right. They have middle names. I forgot. <laughs> 
<laughs> they have, some, some of them have middle names. Okay, Hubert Alexander. My uh, 1980 Honda bike was Kyle Hooper. <laughs> Okay, and then uh, and then we had a, a V-Dub, a 2004 V-Dub Jetta wagon, and what was his name? I forgot. His name's Hansel. No, that's right, Hansel. He, he's German. <laughs> right, Hansel, a very German name there. And then we have Fred, the car, the, the uh, let's see, 1995 Toyota Camry that was given to us by some friends. That, that car's name is Fred. And then last, the car that we have now for, for Carrie is a 2009 Dodge Journey named Henry. Wow. Wow. Now, <laughs> which of you started the naming? Uh, that, that's, I, I guess I just got to know, where did that come from? Well, Colonel Mustard was named already okay. when when we met, but I I feel like it came naturally. When we got the uh, Toyota Camry, it was just a Fred. That's great. We looked that's... at it and it was just, yeah, that's, he's Fred. Just reliable, do the job kind of Fred. Okay. Well, since you talked about getting a, a car given to you, why don't you tell me that story? How in the world did that happen? We, uh, at the, okay, so starting from the time that we were carless, a uh, friend of ours, they had, it was one of those hand-me-down cars that had been in their family forever, and he had it, and then he give it, he had given it to his brother maybe two or three years prior, and then he bought a car himself, and then his brother bought another car and was like, hey, I, I'm, I don't need this anymore. Do you want it back? Because again, it was one of those family cars that just got, you know, tossed around between the kids. And he said, well, no, because I have a car now. I don't really need it. And he thought of us because we were carless and they just literally gave it to us for free. I was, I was really surprised and thankful. And, uh, we, we still at the time didn't really need a car, but I thought, Hey, you know, a free car. Well, we'll take that. Now we yeah. can we can get outside of our one mile radius of town that we lived in. <laughs> but one, another interesting thing about that is, um, Carrie had previously a few years before we even met, she had given a car of hers to a friend. And so we, we had a conversation about that. And that, that was something that I had never really considered before. Um, giving a car, I mean, that's much more than, than just paying for somebody's lunch. You know, that's like several hundred and, and, you know, several thousand dollar gift is pretty big and some, something that I probably wouldn't have considered doing, uh, before that time in my life. But now we, we haven't given a car away since then, but I can really, I can imagine in the future that we will give a car or two. I, I would like to because I know what kind of a gift it was for us. Yes. And uh, w- would you like to hear my joke on, on giving cars? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> okay. Get ready. Get ready to laugh, everyone. Drum roll, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Carrie had previously given away a car and then someone gave us a car. So wouldn't that be karma? Oh. <laughs> it had to be. It had to be. It's hilarious, right? He, uh, I love it. Yes. Thank yes. you. Thank you very much. Carrie, I didn't notice you laughing there. <laughs> um, I was mouthing exactly what he was going to oh, say. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> you were ready. You've heard it before. Yeah, I've heard that one a few times. Yes, yes. That's fantastic. That's great. I love it. Yeah, I do too. And and I, you know, I'm a big believer in giving, and that's something that I haven't always, I, I kind of came from things in my past from kind of a scarcity mentality, and I think it's really right. important to, uh, when you can give, you lose that scarcity mentality, and you realize that, you know, things are just things, and they, they can be replaced, and um, and, and I've never given a car to a person, yeah. but my wife and I on a couple of occasions have donated to, uh, you know, the, these can academies, if you're familiar with what those are, that there's some charities that we at least have here locally that, uh, you can donate cars to. And, um, right. So, so we've, we've done that a couple of times and it, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely something that feels good. And, and I'm, uh, I'm sure you guys will, uh, uh, be doing that in the future for sure. And like you said, it's such an impact when you can provide that for somebody who doesn't yeah. have it, right? I mean, it can be a difference maker. Yeah. And, you know, you, you talked about giving. Giving is something that Carrie and I do often um, and, and something that we really believe in and we talk a lot about um, on, our, on, our, um, on our website. And, um, you know, giving just, it, it opens up so much for yourself and for those that, that you're giving to, that you're providing for. Um, one of the things that giving does, at least for me, is it opens my eyes 
to the fact that, you know, life extends beyond just me and, and the, the wall that I have built up around me and my things, yes. my money and my possessions. And it, giving kind of breaks down that wall and makes you realize that this is, we're all in this together. We can give and take. We can help each other out. And it, it just kind of, it, it disrupts the selfish. I, I think we're all to a certain extent by default a, a little bit selfish and that's okay. It's being selfish isn't always a bad thing, but giving can really disrupt a, a, a negative kind of selfish um, attitude when it comes to your possessions and your money and stuff like that. So I, I really believe in giving. It can give you a whole new perspective on, on like you just kind of hinted on, on your finances and your belongings. It can give you a whole new perspective on that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, the other thing that, that I think about when I think about that is that, um, so many people tend to look at what they don't have. And, and so they're always right. looking for something else, but when you're giving to people, you're acknowledging how blessed you are right. and that you're helping somebody else and that there are people out there who are worse off than you. So I, I think that's a big part of it as well. So I, I'm Absolutely. with you hundred percent. Yeah. We're, we're always trying to get, get more, yes. you know, more money, more things, more, you know, it's like it's flowing to me constantly, but, but when we give away and look at it like that, it, it, again, it just opens up a whole new world of, of thinking about possessions and money. Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, I had a gentleman on my show, uh, it's going to air, uh, as I'm recording this tomorrow. And he, one of his, uh, sayings is you have to give to get, and, and, and it's, you know, not just in a charitable sense, but you know, any, if you're giving value, you get value. If you're giving more at work, then you're going to get more out of work. And so right. you know, it's on and on, but so, yeah. Um, okay. Well, let me get you back to, uh, to, to some car stories here because, uh, there's another one I want to get to. And that is, uh, uh, once you guys got together, now you've, you've got, uh, Fred and what's, <laughs> what's the, what's the first car you guys as a couple, uh, purchased? Cause I, cause I, you know, that's, to me, that's a whole nother thing when you got to come together and agree on, on vehicles. Right. So the first car that we purchased together was a 2004 Jetta wagon. Uh, this is Hansel we're talking about. And the reason we bought Hansel was because, as I mentioned before, I was working three blocks from where I lived and eventually I got a different job. And this was, this is 20 miles into town. Uh -huh. So we were forced to buy a car at that point. So we did a lot of research. We, you know, decided together what sort of car we wanted. We both really liked V-dubs. Of course, Derek had his V-dub from previously and, um, I liked the look of the, you know, the VW wagons. And I wanted to think ahead into, you know, we're going to be having kids someday. Maybe we want something a little bit bigger with some space so that, you know, just in case we have kids in the near future, we've got this car. So we do a bunch of research and um, like tons and it comes down to it. We decide Jetta wagon. We find the specific one and we buy. Um, we bought Hansel and he was great for all of 35 seconds after we bought him. And after that, immediately started having problems with them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, I, I just know that feeling. Uh, you, you make the purchase and there's always a little bit of nerves anyway, right? Be because you're doing something, uh, taking a bit of a risk. And, and, and then you start to get that sinking feeling like, oh, I really didn't make a good decision here. So, so what, what happened uh, 35 seconds in? Um, after we, we drive off and we go to a gas station on our way to the gas station, uh, Hansel's check engine light comes on and we're like, huh, well, that's interesting. And we call the, the person we just bought him from to ask, you know, do you know of anything that could be wrong? And he says, oh, well, it, it could be that the gas cap isn't screwed on all the way because with these cars, the check engine light comes on when the gas cap isn't on. And we're like, oh, okay, well, we'll try that. That wasn't it. <laughs> and I can't even tell you what it was because there were so many, it was just problem after problem after problem the entire time that we had Hansel. Hmm. Um, we, we've spent thousands of dollars on repairs, which is ridiculous because we spent so much time getting such a good deal. And then we ended up spending so much money in the long run. We could have gotten a much nicer car had we, you know, known we were going to spend that much money in the first place. Sure. Sure. Yeah. You know, and that's one of those things I, I've made uh, bad car buying decisions myself. I, I bought a car one time where the miles were rolled back on it oh. and, um, and, and it was, you know, I, I was buying it from an individual because inexpensive cars, I don't believe buying from a dealer. Sure enough, this guy was working for a dealer selling 
cars out of his home with his wife and small daughter and, you know, just look like this normal guy had this car for a long time, according to him. And, uh, Carfax wasn't around back in those days, but I wound up having to have the engine rebuilt, the transmission rebuilt, the AC repaired, oh. uh, re- rework all the brakes. I mean, I spent at least probably one and a half times what I paid for that car. Ooh. And the, the problem is, and you guys make him relate to this, maybe not, but once you get a certain amount of depth into the to the the cost of making those repairs, you start thinking, well, what else can go wrong? I've right. repaired everything, you know, and uh, and so you wind up keeping it, and then another thing goes wrong. So, um, so that was a real big lesson for me, and uh, and so I've I've gotten a lot wiser about some of those things. And Carfax is out there now to help protect us from uh, from some of that as well. But uh, but what what kind of takeaways did you guys have from from that experience that, that made you wiser uh, uh, going forward? You know, that's a good question because I think buying, to a certain extent, buying a car, any car, is a bit of a gamble to a, to a certain extent, even if you do all of your research. And the thing is, with this car, we test drove it twice, and there was no issues. It, it felt and sounded like it was running perfect. I think... I truly believe that we just happened to buy the car during a season in its life that it needed all of these repairs. I think yeah. that we just had bad luck. I really, truly believe that. Um, so as far as a lesson, I really, I actually think that we did everything that we could have done. Okay. I don't think that we could have done anything differently and we just kind of got a, a little bit of bad luck. Now uh, for our, the next car that we bought, the, the Dodge Journey, I think we got, we did all the research that we could do yep. and it's a great, great car. We haven't had one issue with it yet. And so I think in, in this, uh, for, for this car, we're, we've had a, a bit of good luck. Um, but of course, and I'm sure that you, you know, a whole, you know, um, a whole lot of things that you should do look for when buying a car. And I think we did most of them, but maybe there's some, something that we overlooked. Um, I will say that. Uh, Hansel, the car that we bought and had a bunch of issues with, it was uh, the day that we bought Hansel, Derek and I were, uh, we'd narrowed it down to two cars and we uh, did a pros and cons and we honestly couldn't figure out which one to get. We were like, it's, it's, you know, six and one half dozen the other. And, um, we didn't, um, didn't really know which, which way to go. And so we ended up almost doing an eeny, mini miny mo yep. and, and we ended up buying Hansel. But Hansel was the cheaper car. And I think that there was a little bit of that that um, hypnotized us some. Like we were drawn to the lower price tag. Sure. And had we gone with the other car, it was a little bit newer. And so, we, you know, who knows if we would have had issues with that one as well. But I think it, it would have been less likely just because it um, had fewer miles and it was newer. Um, but we were drawn to the lower price tag. So, uh, again, we, we did a lot, you know, a lot of things right. Um, but had they been the same price, I don't know. I don't know which way we would have gone there. Yeah. And, and I do agree with Derek that every time um, you buy a car or pretty much anything else, um, and that's even if you buy a new car, it's a bit, right. you're taking a risk. And, uh, you know, I I bought a new car, was covered fully by a warranty, and, and I had problems with it that the dealership never did solve for me. So, you know, you think uh. when you buy something with a warranty that, you know, automatically it's like, hey, it's, they're going to take care of it. Well, they try, but, uh, you know, they're yeah. human and. And it depends on, uh, you know, how good the company is standing behind the vehicle. And, uh, and, you know, mine turned out not to be that good. And I was young and inexperienced. So I probably didn't press them as hard as I could have. Right. Um, but, but so, uh, so, so, so we, yeah, we, we definitely learned some lessons there. And, and, you know, my goal with this, with this podcast and with the information that I put out about my own life experiences around cars is to try to tilt the, uh, uh, the advantage to the person and minimize the risk that they're taking by right. giving them some good information. You know, and the only thing I could say to you guys, and I don't know if you, if you did do this, but, um, it, it's something that I, I, um, uh, haven't always done, but I try to do, um, now more so is to, uh, take a vehicle to a mechanic and have them look it over, um, just to make yeah. sure that I'm not missing something because, you know, that that's a good point because we did not do that with this car. However, we did do that with our, with our Dodge journey. We did take it in and get it checked out and they said there's no problems with it. So maybe that could have uncovered some of that stuff and we could have avoided it. Good, good tip. 
Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. And I'm glad you mentioned that on the journey because that's, that's good because, um, you know, I had a guy on just recently who, um, ha- has rebuilt engines in cars and, and was, you know, pretty, pretty savvy about them. And he was buying from a dealership and ran into an issue where they were, uh, trying to sell him a car that, uh, had a bunch of rust damage in the frame and it had been repaint, sandblasted and repainted in such a way that it was really difficult to see. And he had crawled underneath the car and couldn't find it. And his mechanic found it. So, oh, wow. Yeah. So, <laughs> so the kind of thing where even when you've been around the cars a lot, there's a benefit to that. Yeah. And you know, you, you just talked about sort of the mission of your podcast. And that's one of the things that I was drawn to immediately and why I love your podcast and your message so much is when it comes to cars, there, there's so much um, shady business out there, you know, the used car salesman, but not not only the shady used car salesman, but just the everyday person is not a mechanic. Right. We're, 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 so everyone, almost everyone has a car, and yet you're faced with making these decisions that you're not really capable of making as far as the mechanics of the car. Is this a good deal? Is this a bad deal? There are There's so many question marks that you have to navigate as a car buyer. And, and then add on top of that, the financial, um, that, that's where, you know, the mechanics of a car and all that and, and the financing and paying cash and all that, where they meet in the middle is kind of where I see your podcast and your message meeting. And, and I'm a finance guy. So when I see people getting car payments and spending way, way too much on cars, it just, oh, it just drives me crazy. So getting better information out there to the world for, um, car buying purchases and how to do it right and all that stuff. It's such a huge, huge financial decision in people's lives over and over. You're going to have several cars throughout your life and you're going to, you're going to put, gosh, I mean, I guess the average person off the top of my head, you're going to spend over a hundred thousand dollars and that's, that's just purchasing the car. When then we talk about insurance, repairs, gas, and all the things, if you get into a wreck, all the things that are involved in a car, it's well over into the six figures over an entire life. Such a huge, huge part of your financial life. Yeah. You know, it's funny you should say that because I, I went back and calculated. I've estimated what the cars I've purchased just for myself, not including spouses and that sort of thing, um, just for myself. And uh, and I've spent one hundred and fifteen thousand dollars just on the purchase price of cars. Now, I want to compare that to today where the new cars cost thirty two thousand dollars on average and people are replacing them. Um, They are keeping them longer about every six years. You know, and and that's if a, if, a, if a family only has one, you know, they're they're going to hit that hundred thousand dollar mark after about twenty four years, and that's again just with one car, uh, assuming that they're buying new. So, yeah, there's a there's a lot better ways you can put that money to work for you. Yeah, and and I guess that's if you is that if you pay cash for that car? Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. So when we talk about comparing that to to car payments, I just can't imagine how much money people are throwing away on car payments. Ugh. Yeah, and, and they keep going up. I I, I was just talking uh, uh, a month ago about car payments being the average new car payment being four seventy one. Now it's four seventy four. So, you know, it just keeps creeping up. And you know, just one more thing I'll share here before we get back because uh, uh, I want to hear more of your stories. Sure. But but there's one piece that um, uh, recently hit me, and that is, I saw that uh, student loans. The average person ha- uh, in the U.S. has about twenty six thousand dollars in student loans. They also have about $26,000 in car debt oh. and everybody's talking about the student loan crisis in our country. Yeah. And my view of that is, is, well, that student loan is going to be paid off in about 10 years for most people, uh, assuming that they can you know, pay it at all. But the car, that $26,000 car debt, that's only going to continue as they buy cars in right. the future. So that amount never goes down. And oh, by the way, cars are going up pretty significantly, uh, you know, every year. So that number is going to continue to grow, and yet nobody's talking about a car crisis. And uh, and so I, I, I find that interesting that, you know, the same amount of debt on average, one's a crisis and one isn't. Right, right. And I would add to that that um, it, it would be – I'm going I'm to paint a very broad brush uh, on this statement, but it would be um, more necessary to – in order to achieve getting an education with a loan – and far less necessary to achieve having a car 
through a car payment versus cash. A lot of people can't pay cash for a college education, right? So you get loans. Right. I can understand that. But so many people can pay cash for a car if they just uh, um, figure it out, do some math, cut back in some other areas. It's just so much less necessary to have a car payment. And you can pay cash for a car so much easier than you probably realize. Absolutely. That is so true. I'm glad you said that because I think so many people have this mentality that, um, you know, that they can't get a good car for a cheap price. And the fact is they can. And, uh, you know, one of the things I really warn people against is um, if you're going in for that like $5,000 and below vehicle, you know, don't go to a used car dealership. I mean, right. you know, it's not that there aren't some good cars out there and you can't find some deals, but you're just putting yourself a lot more at risk. So, you know, since I'm talking about car dealers here, um, do you guys uh, have any experience with, with car dealerships? I mean, you, you've talked about a couple of cars that you've purchased and it sounds like they were from individuals and stuff. Yeah. Uh, um, let's see. The cars that we've bought, we've bought them from individuals. So on this most recent car, when we bought uh, the, the Journey, we did hunt around a little bit just because we were curious. We went to a couple of dealers and we went to a, a used car dealer. We We went in with the mindset that we are not buying a car today. Yep. Said no matter what, even if it's, it's the perfect car, we are not buying a car today. No, under any circumstances, will we buy a car today? Okay. So th I think that's what you got to do when you go into a dealer or a used car. So, so we go in, um, and this guy, we test drove a car that we had seen advertised and it just wasn't what we wanted. It, it just, nah, we don't like it. It's, it's, it was a little bit too much anyway. What we want uh, over our budget, our budget was between 10 and $12,000. So. Of course, uh, being a used car salesman, <laughs> he, he tried, he put us in another car. And here's the thing too. They wouldn't tell us how much any of these cars cost until we test drove them and until we got back to the office. And that drove me crazy. Absolutely. I, I, I was like, why are you wasting my time? I, I was almost personally offended because you're literally wasting my time. Okay. So then we get back into the office and we're like, okay, so this is the second t car that we had test driven. How much does this car cost? You're going to have to tell us eventually how much the car cost. And he, uh, he wrote down on a piece of paper, $19,000. Now keep in mind, I, I had actually, I, I don't think I mentioned this. I told the guy that our budget was between 10 and $12,000. Okay. He wrote down $19,000 and I almost, I mean, I almost stood up and walked out right then, but it was kind of getting entertaining. So he, he wrote down $19,000, scratched it out immediately and wrote $17,000. And I was like, <laughs> what, okay, you know, like <laughs> you just made up because they didn't advertise any of the prices. You just made up $19,000. Okay. And then scratched it out and put what the actual r price really is, $17,000, just to make it appear like, boom, I'm saving $2,000 right off the top. And I was like, well, no, because that's, because guess what? Our budget, like I told you, was between 10 and $12,000. So he scratched out 17,000 and put 16. And I was like, <laughs> no. You keep going. He did this several times until I think he got down to four. Was it 14, five? I think 14, five, yeah. 14, five, 14, five. And I was still said, absolutely not. And then he started talking to me about payments, about how we could <laughs> look up a credit and start getting some credit payment options going on. And it was just, it was hilarious. It was on, on, on one hand, it was hilarious. But on the other hand, I was actually getting kind of offended that yes. that he was trying to to you know strong arm me and in, into not only get payments but get payments for a car that was way above what I had told him we were willing to pay. Yeah, that that's uh, that can be very frustrating. And I think um, you know for anybody out there listening, if you even if you don't listen to me and you go to a dealership that's you know that, where where you're going to buy a, a an inexpensive car. If if they won't tell you the price, that's a red flag. Yeah. <laughs> leave. Leave right then. Go to some place where they will talk to you like a grown up and 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 work with those people. And absolutely. And, and by the way, I don't when you get cars you're buying over ten thousand dollars, I do think there's a lot of good dealerships out there for that. 
I tend to say go to used car dealers that are associated with new car dealers because I think they get the best trade-ins and, right. and they can keep the cream of the crop kind of a thing. But, um, but there, you know, but there are some good ones out there for sure. Um, you know, you're not going to get necessarily a great deal, but, uh, you know, it'll be easier, right? you know, if you want to, if you, you know, for the, for those people who have that mindset, but one of the reasons I start with the low end uh, under 5,000 is because I want people to realize they can save enough to buy something. And then as they continue to save, they can upgrade as, as they need. Right. And, um, uh, you know, but once, you know, my wife and I, I think, um, you know, other than the new cars that we've purchased at some point in our lives, um, our used cars, we've never paid more than $16,000 for them. And they've been very nice cars. Um, we've been very happy with them. So, um, you know, definitely you don't have to go over that amount to pay no. cash for a car. And you can save that much if you're not making car payment. Oh, absolutely. You can, you can save it again. Like you can save up how oh, so quickly avoid a car payment. If you just do a little bit of math, a little bit of work, you can see how doable it is. It's, it's really incredible. And, and you know, you mentioned cars under $5,000, which I love and I totally agree with. Fred, our car that was given to us is 19 years old. It's a 95 Toyota Camry. Yep. It drives great. It's in two years. It has not broken down or left me stranded, not even one time in two years. And get, well, you probably already know this, but okay, for, for everyone listening, the Kelly Blue Book on that car, if I were to uh, sell it to a dealer, the Kelly Blue Book is, I think it's $145. Wow. <laughs> and how much value do you get out of that vehicle, right? I mean, oh, I isn't mean, that amazing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And just to think of, even if, see, we were given this car, so people are thinking, oh, well, it doesn't count because you, you were given the car. Okay, forget that. Even if we had paid whatever the fair market value was back then, even if we had paid 2000 3000 4000 $5,000 for this car, let's just say there's no way it was worth $5,000 back then, yeah. uh, two years ago. Let's just say that I had paid $5,000 for this car. Not one single repair in the last two years. It hasn't broken down or left me stranded in two years. Even if I had overpaid $5,000, it still would have been far more worth it um, if I had gotten a better car or, a quote, more reliable car yes. and, and made payments on it. Yeah, that. It's a really interesting point you're making there because the, the average car is $32,000. I mentioned that earlier. According to Edmonds uh, and their depreciation calculator, that $32,000 car loses 70, I believe it's $7,800 the first year. That's in the right ballpark anyway, 79, 78, right in there. So that car loses that much in value the first year. And yet, like you said, even if you had spent $5,000 on this car, you know, you, you mean even if it, if it went down to zero, you wouldn't have right, spent as right. much as they do the first year <laughs> in owning a new car, right? I right, mean, exactly. So that's really crazy. And it, <laughs> even if even if this car would somehow have a, a value of negative two thousand dollars, <laughs> that's right. You would still be ahead. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It, can, it can only go down to zero. So if you're losing seven thousand eight hundred on buying a new a new car ver versus you know buying a, a a real old beater and losing. All of its value, one hundred percent of its value. But if it's only three thousand dollars, then you're way ahead. You are. That's, right. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah, oh my it, gosh! It, it's. I mean, the car thing is a really crazy deal, and uh, you yeah, know, I think you know it, it's one of those things. I will say when I talk to people about it, I mean, a lot of people have you know excuses, and they'll say, "Well, you know that I understand what you're doing, and I agree with it, but it doesn't work for me because," and they'll give me their because mm -hmm. reason, right? The thing is, it's, it's people don't really think about how much it impacts them. And, um, and they just, yeah, they just buy into this myth or this lie, um, that the car dealers and, and the advertising agencies put out there. And it's a powerful, I mean, you know, you, you watch football or, you know, uh, primetime TV and man, you're just inundated with the lifestyle of, of driving these new cars. And right. uh, you, you just believe that everybody who's got money, um, has a new car. And I'll tell you. Having done this podcast for a while now um, and having, having had a chance to interview a lot of really successful people, I'm going to tell you, I'm hard pressed to find a really like either somebody who's starting a business or somebody who has a successful business who's in debt for their car. Um, right. It's amazing to me how, 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 how many people are, are buying with cash. Now, 
Um, I, I, I'm probably keeping you guys longer than you planned here, but, uh, but I do, I want to get to something else that, uh, that you guys do because I just think it's okay. so bold. Um, you guys publish your financial, uh, uh, statement every month and you tell the world what you make and what you do with your money and yeah. all that. That's, that's just wild to me. So t- t- tell me about how you, you know, decided to do that and. Yeah. Yeah. So we do, we, on our, on our website, our website is Derek and Carrie.com. Uh, for those who wanted to check that out. And we post our everything. We post our monthly budget and then we post our net worth. So we post our debt. We have a little bit of student loan debt that, that we are, um, well, it, it, I say slowly, but after a year or two, you feel like you've done it kind of fast. We're, we're chipping away at that student loan. Um, and then we've got some, a couple of investments. We've got some retirement accounts and stuff like that. So we post everything on our website. Uh, we thought about doing that for over a year. We thought and prayed about that a lot because that's not something, you know, it's kind of drastic and, yeah. and, 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 uh, it's not something that we take lightly. So we didn't just do that on a whim. We thought very, very, very carefully about doing it. And, and we thought about doing it for the right reasons because, you know, we were, we were worried that people, oh, you guys are bragging or you guys are, you know, you shouldn't do that or you should keep that private. I, I disagree. First of all, we're not bragging. Second of all, the reason why we post our monthly budget and all of that is so that we can have a real, open, honest, transparent conversation about money. When, when you know, it's only so helpful to get a whole bunch of uh, budgeting tips or do this or do that, or here's how you get out of debt or whatever. It, that That's really helpful. But, but at a certain point, it, it, it becomes unhelpful in the sense that it's not real. Yeah. It's not like, let me see how it really works. Okay. I understand what you're saying, but I, I need to see it in action. I need to see it in motion. So we put it all out there. Uh, and, and the response has been really positive. The, the response has been overwhelmingly positive. We were pretty nervous that first month. Gosh, you know, what, what, what are people going to think? What are the, what's the response that we're going to get here? And it was great. And we've had a lot of support. And then even it, and also, if you go to our website, if you, if you go to any of the blog posts, just search monthly. Actually, actually, if you go to our website and you hit monthly budget, or I think it says our budget or something like that. It'll take you to the most recent blog post. And at the end of every blog post at the bottom, I link to another blog um, where there's a huge list. It's, I think it's up to 60, 60 other people who also wow. post all of their monthly budget and their net worth. And that list is a wealth of knowledge and experience and, and, um, uh, um, just, yeah, well, um, knowledge and experience. And that, that list goes from the, it's listed from the, the biggest net worth to the smallest net worth. The biggest net worth on that list is $2 million. And the smallest net worth on that list is, I think, negative 200,000. Wow. So it's, it's a wide range of, of other people who are also, um, putting it all out there and, uh, sh- and, and posting all of their financial information. Yeah. Well, my hat's off to you, uh, on that for sure. I've, you know, I'm trying to be as transparent as I can with my audience. I'm not quite to, to that point of transparency, uh, at this point. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, uh, Mrs. Cash Car Convert would be yeah. as good with that either. But, um, one other question around that and, and, you know, because it's one thing for strangers to to uh, have access to this information, but friends and family have that as well. How has that yeah. interaction been? We, we haven't had any issues, not even one. Um, I am I'm very well aware that um, um, I think all of the members of, of, of our family, both sides, uh, they see it. Uh, so we haven't had any issues at all. I think it's one of those things where it's, 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 um, controversial or it's exciting for about a minute. Mm. And it's like, oh my gosh, you're posting how much money you have. And, and you go look at it and then you think, oh, wow, that, you know, that's, that's interesting. And it continues to be interesting, but the shock factor fades really fast. Yeah. And then it becomes, um, it becomes kind of old hat. It becomes kind of ordinary after the initial, uh, shock. Oh my gosh, I can't believe you're doing that. 
yeah, it, it becomes like, uh, yeah, no big deal. <laughs> well, I'm going to shift to one other thing here, and then I will uh, give you back the remainder of your day. Great. Um, the next one is, um, I know you guys are big into budgeting, right? Obviously, you you, you post uh, your net worth and everything online there. So a lot of people look at budgets in a very negative way. They feel like it's a straight jacket on their money, and, and, and it, it keeps them from doing what they want, et cetera, et cetera. Can you tell me how you guys working through a budget together has strengthened your marriage Oh, yeah. and, and what kind of lessons you've learned around that? A, a budget is never restraining or restrictive ever. It feels like it is, but a budget, it, doing a budget is the very thing that will give you financial freedom, hands down. Uh, one, one of the illustrations that I use to describe it is is take a kite, just a, just a kite that you would take out to a park with your kids. If you hold that string on that kite, that's what allows it to fly. Uh, it, um, that restraint that, that on, on that kite. If you let go and set the kite free, it'll crash. It'll crash into the ground. So that's one of the illustrations that I use for when people say, Oh, a budget just, it's bad news. And all it tells me is what I can't do. Well, yeah, you can't do that anyway. It's, it's, it's your budget's telling you that anyway, whether you have your hand, head buried in the sand or not. It's not the, the fact that you did a budget that now all of a sudden you can't do all of these things. A budget is, is, is freedom. It allows you to, to work your way towards doing everything. And, and if you're not doing a budget, then what are you doing? You're just sort of feeling your way around. You're sort of drifting with the breeze or just going wherever the current takes you. You're, you're being controlled rather than doing the controlling. So. I oh, mean, I, I mean, but I've seen budgets set people free, especially if you haven't been doing one recently or for a long stretch of time. And then you start doing a budget. Oh, the light bulb that goes off and, <laughs> and all the possibilities <laughs> that go along with doing a budget. It's just amazing. And it's a really, it's a joy to see those light bulbs go off in, uh, in people's lives when they start getting a handle on their money. That's fantastic. Well, that's, I really appreciate that. That's, Good information. Uh, I hope the listeners out there, you guys are taking that in that, you know, that, that really doing a budget is going to teach you a lot about where your money's really going. And the fact is, the truth is the truth. Your money's going where it's going. You've only got right. as much as you've got. So this is just kind of holding up a mirror and telling you where you really are. Yeah, it, it's yeah, it's holding up a mirror to what's already there. It's already there. As we close out here, what's um, what's one thing you would recommend to somebody who's out there and they're looking at that mountain of debt and, you know, they've got the car payments and the whole thing. Um, what's one yeah. thing you'd recommend that they do to, to, to start today? I, I would say the first step is organization. A lot of people that they don't, I, you know, you can't even tell me what your payment is. You can't even tell me what the interest rate is. You, you don't even know how many months until. Uh, if you're making the payments that you're making until that, that payment is, is done. Yeah. Um, so knowledge is power that once you get the knowledge, Hey, if I pay this much, it's 16 months, but if I pay this much, it's 12. Hey, I can do that. That's only, uh, I'm, I'm making these numbers up, but that's only another $35 a month or, or whatever it is. I'm, I'm making those numbers up. But once, once you organize a plan, Bring in your net worth. What list out your debts. Go into your student loan and dig deep into your student loan because a lot of people don't know that they think they have one student loan payment it means that they have one student loan. But but what's probably going on is you've got several different loans and some of those have different interest rates. Right. And a lot of people don't know that. And it's because they're not organized and they're not digging into their own financial situation. Once you organize a plan and see what's really possible and really doable, gosh, that can be really, really motivating and really encouraging. And, and that can be the thing that inspires you to start taking more action and, and start making more progress faster. I, I think that's a great first step. Again, get organized, find out where you are, and then you yeah. Figure a plan. And a that, that's that's the only way that you can find out what's possible. How yeah. how else would you know what's possible? And newsflash: what's possible is there. There's so, there's so much more that's possible than you probably think. It, it, especially if you if you haven't organized all your all your financial information. Right. Yeah. Absolutely right. 
Well, hey, Derek and Carrie, I really appreciate you guys being on. It's It's been a blast for me. I love your show. I love what you're doing. Uh, where's the best place for people to reach out to you guys? The best place is our website, DerekandCarrie.com, and it's spelled D-E-R-E-K and then the word and, and Carrie is C-A-R-R-I-E, DerekandCarrie.com. That's the best place. And, and if you're on iTunes, chances are you're listening on iTunes or Stitcher or something like that. We have a podcast as well. You can search for Derek and Carrie, or you can search for Better Conversations on Money and Marriage. That's our podcast, Better Conversations. And and Carrie, if, if you haven't noticed, she's been really quiet for the past 15 minutes. That's because she left because our two-month-old daughter started crying in the next room. So it's just, I'll have to say goodbye for Carrie as she is taking care of our, of our newborn baby. I appreciate she's got her priorities straight. <laughs> yeah. No, that's great. And, uh, I got to say, I never heard it. So, uh, so yeah. fantastic. I know everybody out there listening is like, what? The baby was crying out. Yeah. So, uh, fantastic. Well, I do appreciate you guys being on so much. Again, awesome. I enjoy everything you guys are doing. I'll have all of this stuff linked up in the show notes so people will right. be able to get access to your site. Uh, reach out to you, listen to you on iTunes, and uh, just, just fantastic. Keep up the good work. I really appreciate what you guys are doing. Thank you for having us on. This was fun. We really appreciate it. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. This is James Kenson, and I uh, hope you enjoyed this episode of the Cash Car Convert podcast with Derek and Carrie Olson. I hope you'd also uh, go out and give a listen to their podcast. It's going to be linked up in the show notes, but the name is Better Conversations on Money and Marriage. And it's a really fun uh, podcast to listen to, but they really, the conversations they have, uh, they're so authentic and they sound so good. And I really do think that there's a lot to be learned. If you take a look at their situation, when they got married, uh, they were going through, one of them was going through a foreclosure. They got married, they didn't have any vehicles, and they found that by working through their financial situation together and having conversations about it, it actually brought them closer and it made their their marriage better as well. And I've, I've heard a lot of people talk about this, that when you really come together and work together on your finances, that it brings you together uh, more as a couple. And so I think um, there's some really good nuggets in their podcast about those very things. And I think you will uh, benefit from listening to those. But for today, I hope you uh, benefited from listening to the show and the conversations they had about their cars, the good and the bad. And I would say, you know, what Derek said is true. Any vehicle you buy, uh, there's a risk associated with it. And just to reiterate my view, I'm going to try to tilt things in your favor uh, by giving you the best advice I have from the years of experience I have for the mis- from the mistakes that I've made and from some of the good choices I've made as well to help you make better choices about your car. And uh, I really encourage you to get on a budget, really start thinking about how you can uh, start to uh, reduce the money going out of your house. Uh, there's you know two sides of the equation. There's the income and the outgo. If you can't increase your income easily, you you better work on increasing the uh, out, or decreasing the outgo, and that's really uh, you know very doable. There's lots of uh, of ways to cut back, and some of you out there may be thinking you don't have a way, but you know think about uh, you know your cable bill or you know your internet. Uh, you know how much speed do you really need? So uh, so there's there's probably some areas where you could cut back. Maybe going out to eat. Those are kind of the obvious uh, ones that kind of jump out at most people. And uh, it's painful. I mean, nobody likes giving up cable channels. But, uh, you know, if you remember my episode with uh, Tom Corley, who wrote Rich Habits, uh, you know, the rich aren't out there watching TV. Uh, They're they're reading books to uh, better themselves. So uh, let's take a lesson from that and try to do do more of that. I, I know I'm trying to. So I think that was a good episode. And I I really appreciated the authenticity that uh, that Derek and Carrie brought. And uh, if you go out to their website, uh, DerekandCarrie.com, you will see uh, their net worth, their budget, and how they're doing on a monthly basis. And if you click on a link there, then you can see how, I believe he said, 62 other people are doing with their budgets. That should be some great motivation to uh, to any of you out there, no matter where you are in the uh, in the debt cycle. 
or in the auto debt cycle um, to give you a way to to, uh, see your way out. With that, I'm going to wrap up uh, this episode of the Cash Car Convert. Um, And (laughs) no worries, I'm not going to sing anything this week. Um, I hope you guys laughed as hard uh, at hearing that as I did when I heard it uh, back. Uh, Hope you guys enjoyed that uh, or at least got a laugh out of it. But I do want to uh, talk about ratings and reviews. And the uh, uh, if you're finding value in this podcast and you think it might help other people, a really good way to help it get noticed is to subscribe, do a rating, and also do a review. And right now I'm sitting at 35. When I get to 50, then I'm going to give away Smart Money, Smart Kids with uh, Rachel Cruz and Dave Ramsey. Uh, both autographed that book. So uh, I'll be giving one of those away to... Uh, one of the lucky people who uh, gives me a rating and review, uh, one of the first 50. So I'll be looking forward to uh, giving that away when the time comes. If anybody wants to uh, reach out to me or has a question, you can send me an email at james at cashcarconvert.com or you can use my SpeakPipe uh, connection on my website at cashcarconvert.com. You can also reach out to me on Twitter, and that's at cashcarconvert. And uh, those are probably the best ways to uh, get a hold of me. And I'd love to hear from you. Love some feedback on the show. If you've got a question, I'd love to uh, have an opportunity to to uh, speak to you. Or, you know, if I get enough people responding with questions and, you know, I can do a whole episode doing nothing but answering uh, listener questions. And uh, I certainly hope to get there someday. In the meantime, I hope you're enjoying the, uh, the show. I'm doing my best to put go- good content together for you. And I'll certainly continue to do that. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, You guys all mean a lot to me. I really appreciate every listener. I hope you're uh, going to have a great week, and I look forward to uh, speaking to you guys again next week. God bless.